Shadow Truth, and today is Monday, July the 18th, 2016, and your hosts are Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org, and we've got a really great market update for you guys lined up, so here we go, and certainly appreciate everybody being here. Bill Road Fund bought a, a, a mine, I believe it was from Newmont, Glencore, they got it from Glencore. Oh, in Kazakhstan, okay. And Kazakhstan is where all of the major smelting goes on for Russia. Dude, that's a big mine. That's a $2 billion mine. Yep. Yeah, they're not messing around. See, and nobody reports on that, what's going on with the SEO. None. Nobody. Except for me and... And Craig on on very rare occasions, and you'll hear some blips and bleeps here and there, and that's it. So. Yeah, but people are aware of it. I was I was chatting with um, Ian Gordon. I, uh, he's a big um, Kondratiev long wave theorist. He was one of the original guys to start financing junior miners back in like 1999-2000. Okay. And he was commenting about the, the Silk Road, what China's doing, you know. He had an interesting point. What they're, what they're doing is they're building the infrastructure so that they can ship over land because the U.S. military is so aggressive in the oceans. And it's dangerous for, for them to to conduct a lot of economic Gross. shipments via the ocean. So right. that, that's what they're that's part of what they're doing with the Silk Road. And um, they've they've funded the Silk Road fund with sixteen billion dollars. Yes, that's what that's where a lot of the treasury sale dollars are going. Right, exactly. And then I mean, you know, you know, Zero Hedge is sitting there reporting that it's capital outflows from their from their um, reserves, from their foreign reserves. That's not what it is. They're dumping their dollars in and buying hard assets. Right. Well, <laughs> they may not be buying hard assets, but what they're well, doing. Well, that's what a gold mine is. Well, a gold mine is a hard asset, but when you're building out, you know, the solar infrastructure that they're building, when you're building out railways, those are are hard assets, but not today. They're just funding it. Well, that's, yeah, well, it's infrastructure, but it's also hard assets. Like, you know, the $16 billion Silk Road Fund, gold fund, you know, and they're, and they're spending $2 billion on on uh, this gold mine from from Glencore. There you have it. I mean, I mean that's it, huge. It's huge. I mean, that's, that's why I was saying, you know, we need to stay on top of what's going on with that and report any any kind of movement, any kind of change that happens because no one else is reporting it. Yeah, they really you know not. what I mean? There's nothing out there. I mean, and, the, and what's going to happen is, is that the people uh, in the Western world, not just the United States, but the whole of the Western world is going to wake up in just a very few short years and go, what the hell just happened? I mean, because the railways will all be in place, the airports will all be in place, all of the uh, energy necessary will be in place, the nuclear power plants, the hydroelectric, the solar, all of that. Everything that they're doing right now is all being built out. They already have the economic and monetary infrastructure. So all that's left is to put the transportation and the power behind it. That's it. And how are they going to fund it? Through buying gold mines from Glencore. <laughs> you know? I mean, just a few months ago, I think it was back in uh, May or April or May, that the, the director, board of directors of Kazakhstan's International Finance, Financial Center met with the president of the Shanghai Gold Exchange for the specific purpose of gold distribution along the Silk Road project. That's the reason that they met. Yeah, you know, I just found a quote from Bloomberg, believe it or not. They actually reported on this transaction. 
And there's a quote in there, Chinese miners are competing to secure gold assets because there's a consensus that domestic demand will far outstrip local supply due to fast-growing investment demand. And that's one of the reasons why the manipulator, the Western Central Bank manipulators can't push the price of gold lower. Because if they do, it will spell big trouble in the physical market. Well, there, there's already trouble in the physical market, and that's what the problem is. I mean, look how much paper they're throwing at gold and silver just on the COMEX. And there's no way to know how much they're throwing at it on the LBMA, and there's no way to know for sure what they're doing in the OTC derivatives market or the leasing market. And they may be mostly out of gold to lease. It's interesting because the Bank of England now is, is one of the custodial vaults for GLD. Yes. <laughs> Which is a joke. Well, I mean, those the, whatever gold bars they're, they're holding on behalf of GLD, those things are already leased out. They're probably leased out five times over. <laughs> at least, at least five times over. Right, <laughs> and hypothecated. <laughs> and hypothecated. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so oh, I it's mean, a joke. And, and that then just you have, goes, I mean, and then when you start digging into the prospectus, all of a sudden you realize they can use all these sub. They call them sub custodians. Right. And there's no accountability for the sub custodians. So, for instance, if so, if the auditor, which I think only really you know conducts a, a bona fide audit maybe once a year, and it's not even a bona fide audit, they have to give the trustee and J.P. Morgan something like a month's notice <laughs> before they can actually do their work. Well, guess what? They're not entitled at all to to go and audit the sub custodians. I mean, the sub custodians can be doing anything with this gold, and we have no idea. And all it no is, one is, knows. And all it is is an uh, entry on a ledger sheet. That's all that it is. That's all it is. It's an electronic entry on the ledger sheet. And what underscores just how fraudulent this thing is was back in, I don't know, something like 2010. Bob Paisani of CNBC made a big deal about going into the J.P. Morgan. I'm sorry, not J.P. Morgan. It's HSBC is the custodian of GLD, J.P. Morgan which is even more problematic as a custodian of SLV. So Bob Paisani makes a big deal out of going into the HSBC vault, and he was directed over to the area where there's, quote-unquote, the segregated GLD gold, and he picks up a bar, and they show the serial number on TV, and it turns out the serial number was of a bar that didn't belong to GLD. So obviously they had scrambled to move all these gold bars into what was supposedly the segregated GLD area, and they didn't even belong to GLD. <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably didn't have to scramble to move anything. They could have just said, well, here's here it is, and pointed to some gold bars and said, and then he picked one up, and, and of course, it didn't match. So Right, and it was live, so there was no <laughs> way they could control it. <laughs> yeah, the five-second delay wouldn't, wouldn't help them one bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it oh. just just goes to show how fraudulent GLD and SLV are. I mean, there is absolutely no accountability in those prospectuses. And anyone who owns GLD and SLV thinking that they own gold or silver is mistaken. And it's, I, I will say that if you want to index the price direction of gold and silver, GLD and SLV are okay for that. But there's going to be a, there's going to come a point in time when the rubber meets the road, and someone who's really long GLD, expecting a big move upward in the price of gold, is going to wake up, and the price of gold is going to be up a hundred bucks, and GLD is going to be down at least fifty percent, and that's because it's going to words going to have leaked out that GLD doesn't have anywhere near the amount of gold that it re, that it claims to have, which means that the GLD share certificates are unbacked and so i'm just surmising that it'll fall at least 50 percent because the market will say well maybe half the gold is there so it'll only be down 50 percent the first day when that happens my guess it'll ultimately probably trend towards zero two points there dave and one is that people actually believe that they 
or a lot of people believe that they have exposure to physical gold when in fact they do not. And in order to get that physical gold, you have to make a request to receive it. And that request can be simply denied. And, and they have to have a certain number of dollars invested in it to even be able to make the request. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is, or the, that I wanted to ask you about, is that the GLD claimed to have added 18 tons of gold to the account in one day. I mean, I don't even see how that's physically possible when you have the Shanghai Gold Exchange moving somewhere in excess of 25 tons a day, every day, five days a week. I mean, that's, which is pretty close to global mining production, right? I mean, well, you answered your own question there earlier <laughs> when you said it's nothing but an electronic entry. That's what those 18 <laughs> tons were. <laughs> well, I just wanted to get, I just wanted you to get your take on that as far as, you know, I mean, they're, they're claiming to add all of this gold to the account and the SLV is the same thing. They're, you know, they're making all these outlandish claims that personally I look at the numbers and go, well, that doesn't add up because I can look at the S the SGE, the Shanghai gold exchange and go, well, they, they moved, you know, 33 tons today. So how can they have acquired 18 tons? They couldn't, it's impossible, physically impossible, unless they stole it from somewhere like the LBMA. It's just an electronic entry because as, as more people pile in, you know, pile into GLD shares, they have to, they have to create more share baskets, which means they have to at least report that there's more gold in the trust backing those baskets. And that's how it works. And I, I would, I would bet both my parents' lives that that gold is not really in the vault. I would say very little is in there. That would, that would be my bet that they have, you know, 10% of what they claim. You know, that's they, right. And you know what? The thing of it is, we'll never know. We'll no never one will know, know until it blows up. Right. And, and speaking of which, I mean, how, how do you see a default coming about or will there be a default or does it even matter if there's any kind of default whether it's on the COMEX, the LBMA, the GLD, SLV or any any of these fraudulent you know entities that are out there I mean does it matter if one of them defaults or not I mean aren't they technically already in default? I mean if you ask me the COMEX is in default <laughs> because there's so much paper versus what's being reported as the amount of physical that's available to deliver into that paper. Exactly. You know, that, but the issue is in any given delivery period, less than 1% of the long side ever takes delivery. So that in itself is, is a fraud. I mean, because they're supposed to be, because they're supposed, it's supposed to be a price discovery based on physical versus hedging against that physical against future prices. Right? Isn't that what the whole idea behind it is? Well, that's the idea behind a futures market. The futures right. market was originally created so that farmers could get financing to plant their crop in the spring. They would sell. They would sell forward their their crop or part of their crop, get money up front, plant the crop, and then they would deliver that crop into the futures that they sold. But if you applied that to the COMEX and everyone who went along a gold future decided they wanted delivery, the COMEX wouldn't be able to deliver. And really what, I mean, silver futures have been trading, I want to say, since at least the early 60s. It may even be longer than that, so don't, don't hold me to that. Gold futures weren't created until 1974, not coincidentally shortly after the gold window was closed because they realized that they could use gold and silver futures to destroy the price discovery discovery mechanism of the COMEX gold and silver markets. And that's what they've done. They've completely destroyed the price discovery mechanism. And that's what GLD has done also. Because imagine if even 20% of the money that's been invested in GLD was actually directed into physical gold. Yeah. And they wouldn't be able to, the price of gold would be way higher than it is right now. It would be double or triple where it is. At least, that's right. And I don't even think it would take 20% of those dollars. I really don't. 
I think it would take maybe two percent, three percent. I mean, you just need to you just need to enforce accountability on the COMEX and say, okay, you can't issue any more contracts than there than there is physical gold and silver to deliver. Or you know, I mean, sort of the rule of thumb is ten to twenty percent more contracts just for purposes of contract liquidity. Right. I mean, and, and that's understandable and should be acceptable. You know, like you said, somewhere in the ten to twenty percent range because people are going to drop out, things are going to change, there's going to be, you know, various and sundry things that happen, so you need a little bit of a, of a buffer to go on there, so, but not whatever it is, 500 to 1, 600 to 1, whatever nonsense that it is. I mean, from my perspective, though, the COMEX defaulted the day that they had more than, than one claim per ounce of silver or gold that they could deliver at that moment as soon as that trade clicked and was accepted that's when the COMEX defaulted because you cannot deliver more than what you have period I mean you, you, it's that's physically impossible so at that moment from for me that's when the COMEX defaulted and they've been operating under default ever since and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and all they have to do is change the rules whenever they want to, and it doesn't matter. Right, and it's built into the contract that they can declare a force majeure and settle the contracts in cash. So that tells you right there they're fraudulent. Right. <laughs> yes, we're going to lie to you and tell you that we are committing fraud. <laughs> How do you feel right. about that? How do you feel about that, That's Mr. Right. Trader? <laughs> well, where do we go from here, Dave? Well, did we cover the Silk Road? Was there anything uh, else you wanted to mention about the Silk Road? Well, I just think that the Silk Road, I think that the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in conjunction with the Eurasian Economic Union, and those, are, those two massive entities are now formally uh, aligning. Their leadership is all uh, signing off and saying that we're all, all together now. Which, which brings together both Russia and China's uh, monetary and financial systems. Those are now becoming one. That, to me, is huge. And you combine that with the BRICS Consortium and the uh, New Silk Road, One Belt, One Road project, and all of a sudden, things start looking a lot different for the West. I mean, when you have that when you have more than 50% of the global population under one umbrella, when you have somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% of the globe's natural resources under one umbrella, that could be a problem for the rest of the world, and in particular the West, because now all of a sudden, and that 70% natural resources includes oil, it includes gold, Okay, it includes silver, it includes all of these commodities that are that our entire system de is dependent upon. Period, and it includes uranium as well. And I know a lot of people, including myself, have you know somewhat of a problem with nuclear power in light of Fukushima. But the the reality of it is is that they're bringing on more and more nuclear power plants every day on on a global scale. Period. We can't do anything about it. When you when you look at when you look at all of that that I just described, would you not agree, Dave, that that is going to cause huge gyrations in the global markets in a very short period of time? Because all of these things are in place. A lot of the if, if they're not built out now, they're in the, they're working on them literally twenty four seven to get them in place. What do you, what do you think about that? I don't think you want to know what I think about that because I think that's why one of the primary reasons the U.S. is trying to foment a world war here because I think they're trying to use that as a way to stop what you just described. But they, but in the in the article that I wrote, I went into and described the security forces that Russia and China in particular bring to the table right now that the Western world, NATO, U.S., U.K., do not have an answer for, period. In particular, 
the S-400 air defense system and this electromagnetic digital footprint scrambler. The, the Western world does not have an answer for either one of those. Oh, weapons. yes, they do. They do? Read the road. That's where it's headed, dude. And I know Paul Craig Roberts would agree with that. Well, it's hard to argue with a good doctor, that's for sure. <laughs> These people are arrogant enough to believe that if not the U.S. as a whole, at least they can survive a first strike, a first strike attack and prevent China and Russia from retaliating. And that's, that's where I think that's where this is going. So if you want the blueprint to the future, read the road, unfortunately. Well, I don't like that answer, Dave, so I'm going to wait. <laughs> I don't think anyone <laughs> likes it. I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to turn wrong. my cognitive dissonance on and, and say, no, that's not right. <laughs> I go to bed every night hoping I'm wrong. I hope you're wrong, too. So, But anyway, uh, the only thing I could say is, is that, folks, you really need to pay attention to what's going on with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, and what these guys are doing because... There's very, very little reporting. Dave and I are going to do a, uh, try to do a, a much better job of keeping you guys informed. But there are huge changes that are coming in that arena, and they're going to directly impact every one of our everyday lives, period. Because you can't have that kind of formation going on and it not impact absolutely everything and everyone. Or am I wrong, Dave? No, I agree 100%. Well... So it'll give you a good idea if you go, go over to uh, the dailycoin.org and read Gold, Guns, and the New Silk Road. You'll, you'll see, and I included the video where Dave and Alistair McLeod and Craig Hemke and myself did a roundtable uh, last March, March 2015. Still relevant. So, And with that, Dave, I guess we'll let them get back to their morning. Unless they're listening to it this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we'll pick it up on Thursday and, uh, hopefully the band-aids, uh, bubble gum and rubber bands have held everything together until then. So <laughs> sounds good to me. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Talk to you later. <laughs>